And here we are. Uh, my name is James, the pastor here at Roy Christian Church. And um, we've been working for a couple weeks, uh, two or three sessions now, on, um, uh, on the life of David. And we've taken some steps backward into his history to kind of get a running start at, at who he is. Um, so we've been through the book of Ruth, uh, one, one session on chapters one and two, one session on uh, chapters three and four. Um, and so um, if you happen to have your Bible uh, and you want to open it up to the end of the book of, of Ruth, uh, chapter four, <clears throat> just by sort of a way of transition, um, I want to look at those last few verses of Ruth chapter four. Uh, verse 18, this then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. So um, the, our whole goal is to look at the life of King David over several weeks. Um, after this mention here in uh, the end of Ruth, the next time we read about David uh, is over in 1 Samuel 16, which is the next book in, uh, in the Bible. So if you want to flip over to uh, 1 Samuel 16, uh, the NIV has a heading right there at the top that says Samuel anoints David. <clears throat> uh, so in chapter 16, we're going to read how the prophet Samuel, who's he's kind of like everything. He's kind of like a prophet and a priest and a judge. Um, uh, he has a special relationship with God. Really, he's the, the last in a long line of, of really loud voices for God before the kings come. Um, and so we're going to read here in chapter 16 how this prophet Samuel was sent to uh, Bethlehem to anoint one of the sons of Jesse uh, to be the next king. Um, Jesse, just by family tree, is the grandson of of Boaz and Ruth, and according to 1 Samuel 16 and second, or sorry, um, First Chronicles 2, um, Dave or Jesse has uh, eight sons and two daughters, but in one of those lists, there's only names for seven sons. Um, uh, we'll 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 come back to these boys here in a, in a second. Um, but and some people might say see there's a big glaring contradiction there's a flaw in the Bible uh, it says seven here it says eight there <sniffs> throw the whole Bible out because it can't be true we'll, we'll come back to that in a second so, uh, 1 Samuel 16 the Lord said to Samuel how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel fill your horn with oil and be on your way I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem I have chosen one of his sons to be king but Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. He's kind of a big deal. That's kind of like... Uh, I don't know, probably even more impressive than if, if Billy Graham would have walked into your church building on a Sunday morning, the same kind of impact there. <clears throat> Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and then come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited him to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, this is the dude. It's got to be him. Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. 
The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord hasn't chosen him either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We're not sitting down till he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Okay, so Samuel, the prophet judge, um, ambassador for God, runs to Bethlehem because God has said, go to Bethlehem, find Jesse, anoint one of his sons to be the next king. Um, there are several sons. We have Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, who are named here. If you go over to 1 Chronicles 2, you get um, Nathanael, uh, Radai, Ozem. And like, well, that's six. He said there were seven sons that passed before him, and eight, uh, David was the eighth. I, I don't know. Does that mean this is a huge contradiction? We should reject the Bible? I don't think so. It could be... You know, we don't always have all the details that we would like to have. Maybe David's mother had been married before and had a son. Maybe Jesse had been married before with another woman and had a son who, you know, was a scoundrel or something. It could be that after all this took place, um, that this son of David died. Nobody thought enough to write his name down. Um, we, we don't really know. Um, I, I had originally thought, well, maybe it was a son who died really young, but that's even weirder because he passed in front of Samuel and was rejected. So that probably is not actually kind of important. So uh, there are also two daughters that are mentioned in First Chronicles 2. That's kind of unusual. Uh, Zeruiah and Abigail, um, Dave, these two sisters of David had sons who all ended up playing big roles in David's kingdom and administration later on. Um, Abishai, Joab, Amasa, and somebody else. I can't remember right now off the top of my head. Uh, <clears throat> but they, they would all be generals and commanders in David's uh, army uh, much later on, these nephews. <clears throat> So while we got 1 Samuel open here, I probably should give you just a little bit of a breakdown of how it works. So um, the first eight chapters of 1 Samuel um, uh, deal with the, the prophet Samuel himself. Uh, it starts with his birth. It goes all the way through his selection and um, his period of judging Israel being some sort of a... There's really nothing exactly like what those judges did because there was like what we had considered judging, but it was also government. Um, it was an administrative thing. It was leading the people. Um, uh, so anyway, um, Samuel was born under some interesting circumstances. You can go back and read that if you'd like. Um, he, he came as a result of a mount of deep prayer by his mother. Then in verse uh, chapter nine, um, we cover you know, from chapter 9 to chapter 15 the, um, the selection and the anointing of Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel, uh, and we also get to see his rejection by God in those um, six chapters. And then uh, chapters 16 through 30 move from Saul to the story of David. 
um, his selection, which we've just read, and anointing, which we've just read, um, but also his time uh, as a part of Saul's court, um, the civil war that was going on between David and Saul, these two very powerful figures, uh, and then David's ascension to the throne. Uh, there are parallels um, between 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Um, they, 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings were in, initially sort of a part one and part two. Chronicles, both of those books uh, were sort of a, a separate retelling of events. There is a lot of overlap in, uh, in the Chronicles and stuff from Genesis all the way up through Kings. Um, and so um, I do have um, a, a handout um, that will be available uh, here, or I can email you a copy if you'd like. Um, just be sure to, um, uh, to send me a text, 801-940-0748. That's 801-940-0748. I'll be happy to, um, to send you a copy of this. Um, but it, it compares uh, what's going on in Samuel and Kings with what's going on in Chronicles uh, and a description of what's taking place. Some things there are exact parallels, some things there are not. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, you might want to keep this handy as we go through the life of David uh, over the next few weeks. Were they written by different authors? Probably. Definitely Chronicles was. So is that why we have a discrepancy? Well, it's not really a discrepancy. It's just, you know, if you and I write about what happened in the last year, we'd write about different things, even if we we're writing about the same family. Right? You write a Christmas letter and I write a Christmas letter about my family, and we focus on different things. It doesn't mean they're contradictory. It just means the focus is different. That's true. So. Right? Right. Very good. <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, the, the parallel things that I have pulled out here um, go from um, the end of Saul's reign through, um, through the uh, end of David's reign uh, when Solomon becomes the king. So there's actually more, but that was going to be a lot more pages, and so we're, we're just going with what we're really focusing on uh, on here. And it includes the website uh, from which I have stolen this material and printed it on my own. Okay, so um, let's, let's think a little bit more about what's going on here. So Samuel has arrived in Bethlehem. Uh, he is there to pick one of the sons. Um, Jesse is there with... Uh, with his boys, you know, I'm sure kind of like stair steps. Um, uh, they show up to be a part of this sacrifice and to be involved in a meal and celebration. Uh, and Samuel knows that he's going to select one of the sons. And, you know, it's clear that the, the oldest, as is always the case, is the smartest and best looking. Okay. Um, really tall, handsome dude, uh, looks very capable. Samuel's ready, I, you know, in my direct movie director's mind, he's raising his hand, ready to lay it on him, and God says, oh, no, no, not that one. Uh, I've, I've rejected him. Uh, everybody else looks at the outward exterior appearance, um, but I, I don't look at that. He is impressive, but I'm more concerned with the heart. Why, why would the author take special care to note for us how good looking and how tall this oldest king, uh, this oldest son of Jesse's is? Because that's the same definition of Saul. That's why Saul was chosen to be king by the people. The first king of Israel that God didn't really ever want them to have in the first place, but he, he gave them what they wanted. Um, Israel had already had a really tall, really good looking king, and he was an absolute disaster and failure. 
he was a disappointment to God and one of the instances where we see that God has real regret about something that he has done. Um, I, I think uh, also Israel had uh, a lot of importance when the uh, oldest and the first son uh, received sure. the inheritance. Sure, I mean, to be the oldest son was to be the best. You were gonna get a double portion of the inheritance. The responsibility was gonna to fall to you. So, you know, Samuel may have been looking like, well, he's the oldest, he must be the guy. That could be. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna go, if this were a movie, this is the flashback sequence. Uh, we're, we're gonna go backwards about um, six or seven chapters um, to take a look at Saul. Um, go back to 1 Samuel chapter nine. 1 Samuel 9, verse 1 uh, says, There was a Benjamite, that's somebody from the tribe of Benjamin, uh, whose name was, uh, ben, uh, sorry, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Now, I don't know what you have to look like to be said that you're the best looking man in your nation, but um, that's that's pretty attractive. Um, I, I didn't look up to see who was um, 20, 2021's uh, sexiest man alive in America. My guess is it was not my picture on the cover. Um, I, I, so I reject their, um, their judgment process. It's shallow of them. Um, but he is, he's as good looking as anybody ever was. And he is a head taller, you know, this guy, he might only be as tall as, as we are, you know, 5'10", 5'11", 6 feet tall, something like that. But compared to everybody else, he sticks out in every way. He is head and shoulders above the rest of the people, uh, literally. Um, so, Samuel, flipping back to chapter 16, Samuel, we're not making the same, tool, uh, same mistake again. We've already gone with tall and good looking. Let's go with something that's a little more important, something a little more um, essential. We've had good looking presidents, I suppose. Um, they haven't always been the best administrators or, or leaders. That happens. And the, and the Israelites were uh, <clears throat> real stuck on making sure that they get the kind of king the other nations had. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they were also pushing the buttons of Samuel. So here in, in 1 Samuel 9, we start to read about this young man from the tribe of Benjamin. His name is Saul. Um, his father, Kish, is apparently reasonably well off, a successful landowner, businessman of some kind. Um, he's got a bunch of donkeys, and the donkeys have all run off. Um, so uh, the story unfolds here in chapter 9 that Saul and another servant are, uh, are off to chase these wild donkeys all over uh, to find them and bring them home. Um, I'm, I'm doing major condensing of uh, each one of these chapters here, so um, you probably can follow along uh, with the story. <coughs> Saul and the servant have no luck. They look and they look and they look. The donkeys uh, cannot be found. Uh, so they come upon a small town and they have heard that in the town there is a seer, S-E-E-R. Um, this seer, or a prophet, um, is a man of God, and their hope is that if they approach the seer, that this man of God can tell them, where in the heck did the donkeys go? We've got to get home. My dad is going to start freaking out if I'm not home by dark. So they have to have an answer. Um, they, they think they can get some, some help here. When they get to the town, it is Samuel, who is the seer um, there in the village, 
uh, he had stopped there for um, some event. Now Samuel had already had some kind of indication from the Lord the day before that a young man from Benjamin was going to be coming to see him where he was. And the Lord told him that this is the man who would deliver Israel from the Philistines. Okay, uh, if we have our, our big map here of, um, of the Mediterranean world, so you've got um, the, the Mediterranean Sea here, and then there's a stripe of land um, that kind of bumps up against the, uh, the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, and then there's more of Israel um, on the other side, whoops, my direction's wrong here, the other side of the river, um, Philistia is that uh, little skinny strip along the coast. I can't make my thing go right. It's all backwards. Gaza. <clears throat> okay, so so all along in places where there is still a lot of fighting going on, um, the Philistines, Palestines, um, <clears throat> all along uh, along the coast there have been uh, have been pushing into Israel, fighting with them. Um, and um, it's gone on for long enough. Back in the time of the judges, Samson was always fighting the Philistines uh, along with others. And so uh, the Lord has said to Samuel that this son of Jesse, uh, sorry, this son uh, that he's going to anoint is going to deliver Israel from Philistia. I should look at my notes once in a while to not get confused. <clears throat> so, Samuel's in town. A man from the tribe of Benjamin comes in, um, is looking for some information from him about some donkeys. Um, and uh, the prophet Samuel just told Saul that God had a plan for him. He was going to be king. Uh, you get to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 17 to 19. Um, uh, Samuel is talking to all of Israel. <clears throat> We've done a lot of jumping over chapter 9. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt. I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. Okay, so Samuel has laid it out here. He's speaking for God. God is not happy about selecting a king for the people. He's supposed to be their king. They live in a theocracy. God's in charge. He is their benevolent dictator who protects and provides for them in every way. The only expectation is that they will be obedient, that they will respect his will and submit to his authority. Israel has a problem with that. They want to be just like everybody else. We want to be like the Philistines and the Ammonites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Moabites and every other ites that are around us. We want to be just like everybody else. We don't want to be special and different. We want to be like the rest of the world. Now pause. That right there is a pretty good application for us. Let's stop trying to be like all the rest of the world because we have been made special and different because we've been made holy by God for his purposes. Quit trying to be like the rest of the world. Be the man, be the woman that God has called you to be. And quit trying to be like everybody else. Unpause. Okay. Um, so Samuel has called all of Israel together. Probably not every single Israelite in the nation, but all the leaders of the clans and the tribes, anybody who's going to be a possible um, candidate, they come by. Tribe by tribe, clan by clan. Um, Reuben, Simeon, uh, Judah, all, all 12 of them. From, um, from soup to nuts, they all go through. And then when they get to the right clan or the right tribe, which is going to be the tribe of Benjamin, 
then uh, those break into clans and the clans come through and it turns out that it is Saul's clan and they say he's the guy. This is the man. Saul is indicated, um, but when it is time to bring him up on the, on the platform and say to Israel, here is your king, your savior, your deliverer from the Philistines, it's kind of like at the Oscars. Oh my gosh, where, where is he? We can't find him. He must have gone off to the bathroom or something. Where did, where did he go? <clears throat> Saul is hiding um, back in the pile of supplies, whatever that is. Um, I sort of imagine bales and boxes and barrels and bags of everything um, for all these people who have gathered, but he is hiding. Not exactly sure he's ready to be made the king. So that's chapter 10. In chapter 11, uh, by chapter 11, Saul has been confirmed as the king. They finally drug him out of the closet, uh, the supply closet. Um, and um, as they confirm Saul as the king, Samuel gives a warning to Israel and Saul. Okay, now flip over to chapter 12. Chapter 12, verses 24 and 25. Uh, in, in speaking, the Samuel's farewell speech, he's not going to really speak to them again. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. Okay, so this is a, I guess this is Samuel's own flashback sequence, okay? Remember back when you all said, we want to be just like everybody else, okay? You've forgotten what the Lord has done for you. I'm going to remind you here again, Samuel says, of everything that God has done for you, the great things he has done for you. If you lose sight of the one true God, if you lose sight of what he has done for you, if you take your eyes off of him and you go on doing your own thing, carrying out your own will, rejecting him, then I am promising you that, um, that your kingdom and your king are going to perish. Saul won't last. It's kind of like when you're talking to a... <clears throat> person who thinks they know it all and they're just in a hurry to get what they think they've got coming to them and you give them that final warning at the end and they go yeah 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 sure let's just get on with it it's like the pre i told you so i told you so like i'm I, when this happens i'm going to be right here and i'm not going to say i told you so but you and i should remember this okay um Okay, so Saul is installed as king. Samuel says um, farewell to the people. He's no longer the leader of Israel in whatever capacity he was as judge, prophet, and um, probably priest too. Uh, but um, now Saul is the king. Uh, we get a little information in chapter 13 that he was 30 years old when he became king. He reigned over Israel for 42 years. Um, so that makes him 72 um, when he stops being the king at his death. Um, you go down through chapter 13. Um, there's there's a, a little bit of hope. It's like, oh yeah, Saul Saul has got it together. He's he's being the kind of ruler that God promised that he would be. That he is delivering Israel from the Philistines um, almost immediately. Um, if if we believe that from 12 to 13 is like you know the turn of the calendar page. Um, Saul attacks the Philistines and almost immediately by the middle of chapter 13 he does a foolish thing that will cost him his reign and his legacy. Okay, uh, go down to, uh, let's see, verse uh, we'll call it verse 7 and a half. Saul and his troops are there. Um, the, uh, the troops are terrified of what's been going on. 
Um, they're waiting for Samuel. He's not around. They've called for him. He hasn't arrived yet. Um, uh, Samuel's supposed to be there, but he didn't come. And so Saul's men, because of their fear, start to kind of a wall, <laughs> wandering, wandering away from the fight. So uh, King Saul said, tell you what, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. I'll take care of it. And so Saul, the king, who has no authority, no training, no responsibility, no anointing to be a priest for the people, decides that he will take that on. He offers up the burnt offering, and just as he finished making the offering, guess who walks in? Samuel. There's Samuel. By the way, this is free. Um, whenever I imagine Samuel in the Old Testament, he looks just like Willie Nelson. Long, long, scraggly, scruffy, worn out, wrinkly old guy, a couple of gray pigtails on the side. That's, uh, that's what Samuel looks like for me. That'll help you, I'm sure, as you, you know, try to picture him for the rest of your life. The preacher said he looks like Willie Nelson. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so Samuel, um, the gray-headed stranger, pull, pulls up here um, and says, Saul, what have you done? Well, I saw that the men were scattering and you didn't come when you were supposed to. Sounds like a, you know, a kid. And the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You've done a foolish thing. My translation is, you moron. Why would you do that? You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Okay, his reign has barely begun. The new stationary hasn't even arrived yet with King Saul's seal on it. And he has already messed up his entire reign. He was going to have a nice, long, successful reign. His descendants were going to take the throne afterward, but not now. Saul has, has thrown it all away. Okay. Uh, Saul gets rebuked because he was foolish. I would say selfish, probably um, arrogant. That God was... I don't know that Samuel knew what God's what was going to happen. I I believe that Samuel probably had full faith that Saul was the king and that's the way it was going to be. And we're not really told in scripture. Yeah. There there isn't there isn't much detail. We don't have Samuel's journal to go back and see <laughs> this guy is a clown. It's not going to be long till he's out of here. So um, But he just says your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people. Yes. So he has received a, a, a vision from God. God's given him the word. Okay. Saul is done. Now, did, did God, so this will get into a long theological discussion. Did God pick Saul knowing he was going to screw up? Is that the whole reason that God said he's the one? Because that's how the story goes. The people, the people wanted a king, and um, you know they they went by. Uh, uh, God gave Samuel the vision. Okay, this guy from Benjamin's going to come. He's going to ask you about some donkeys. He's the one that should lead the people. Yeah, all we did was sit back and watch the story unfold. I I think it's a part of God saying as as many parents would. Okay, what you want is wrong, and it's going to be painful, but you won't listen, and so there you go. I'm going to give you exactly. Eight, it tells, God tells them that 
he's you know he's going to take your sons and daughters. He's going to make you pay tribute. Yep. He's going to make yep. your life miserable. He's not going to make your life better. Bring us a king anyway. Well, just yeah. like just like at the end of the <coughs> Judges, uh, at the beginning of Ruth, uh, it says uh, God gave them over for themselves. So. Yeah. Every man did what was right in his own eyes is a phrase that comes up a lot. Exactly. So, so that's kind of the deal. Um, Saul, Saul has begun to reign. He's gonna. We don't know exactly when this occurs in his uh, in his tenure as king. Um, if it if it unfolds like it looks like it does, he's got like at least 41 more years of serving as king and making a mess out of it. I hope that's not the case. I hope that there's a bunch of time that has taken place between 12 and, and 13, but, but maybe not. His reign has begun and already he's acting foolishly and rashly and so God disqualifies him um, from ruling anymore. In chapter 14, even if Saul is a knucklehead, he is still the divinely appointed knucklehead right. that God can use. Again, pause. This is like another application for us. God can continue to use people even if they're not the best people or the most willing people to accomplish his purposes. Um, you know, you, you don't need to be Mother Teresa or Billy Graham uh, for God to use you because um, even Teresa and Billy are are flawed as well. Okay, um, again, I always like to make sure we have a little application as we go through. That's why we study scripture. So um, anyway, um, so Saul has some success as a king and commander. The Philistines are beaten soundly. They are sent packing back um, to the coast. Um, it says in verse fifty-two. Uh, no, not fifty-two. Forty. Seven, sorry, um, which is a page turn for me. In chapter 13? Chapter 14. We are going in light, lightning wow. speed here. Okay. Okay, chapter 14, verse 47. After Saul had assumed rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side. Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the king of Zobah, and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, I like this phrase, he inflicted punishment on them. He fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites, delivering Israel from the hands of those who had plundered them. Okay, so I wish we could just stop with the, the line of Saul right there, his reign, because at that point, he has been wildly successful. He has carried out exactly what the Lord said he should and would do. I wish that was the end of Saul's story. It would have been a lot less painful, but that is not the end of the story. Um, in verse 52, um, just at the end of this chapter, it says that all the days of Saul, there was bitter war with the Philistines. And whenever Saul saw a mighty or brave man, he took him into a service. Okay, so his, we can assume the author means like all 40 some years of Saul's reign, there's this constant war with the Philistines, okay? It's not unlike the whole time of my life where there's been fighting in Israel with the, Phil the Palestinians. Um, some, some of those same, same people, same, same family groups are still fighting. <clears throat> Today. Now, 2,000, 3,000 years later. So in chapter 15, Saul, um, Saul is disobedient again. God gives him a very simple command. Attack the Amalekites, totally destroy everything that belongs to them, eliminate them from the face of the earth. They have attacked my people, they are bitter enemies, eliminate them. Can you do that? Go ahead. Scorched earth, we're not bringing back anything. It's all gonna be over. So Saul and his army go to war and they save out King Agag of the Amalekites 
and all of the best of everything. The best food, the best livestock, the best wine, the best, 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 best. There goes thinking uh, for himself again. What did God say? Scorched earth. Nothing left. And what did Saul do? Almost nothing left. But there's some really super nice stuff in there that it would be a shame to just burn it up or destroy it all. Why don't we take some of that for ourselves? I bet we could use that at church. Again, that's the Sarah's translation. We, we can use this to worship God. We can make these sacrifices. Okay, pause. This is a little free deal again. A sacrifice ought to cost you something personally. It's not a sacrifice if it doesn't cost you anything. That's really nice, Saul, that you want to sacrifice things that aren't yours to God in worship. Okay. Saul, Saul, Saul. So Samuel comes and confronts Saul about it. It's like, uh, hey, son, um, is that... Is that sheep I hear? Why, why do I hear sheep? Are, are they, are, is this their dying breaths that they're bleating and bleeding out? What, what's, what's going on? Well, and so Saul lies. He makes excuses. He, he sounds really, every time I read through the life of Saul, I just think, man, he sounds just like a junior high kid. He's always making excuses. He's always trying to worm his way out of something. Well, I just thought that maybe it would be a good thing. Um, he blames the troops. Yeah, it, it was the guys. The, the soldiers did it. I don't know. He's, he's perpetually dodging and weaving, throwing people under the chariot so he doesn't get in trouble. Um, I, I do think that chapter 15 is a good lesson for all of us. When God says, do, clearly, we shouldn't be looking for some kind of a workaround to get what we want. His word, his will is to be executed precisely and completely all the time and immediately. But Saul is selfish and stubborn he is unyielding and not submissive to the Lord's word and probably at least a little clueless about how things should be. And so chapter 15 wraps up with very sad words. The Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Saul is now rejected as king. Maybe there was a chance before that um, that after the first dumb move that maybe he could have been rehabilitated and used. You no, know, God does give second chances to, to some people. Um, but sometimes the, the move is swift. You know, you think about Moses. With Moses at the rock, he's trying to get water for the people. God says, talk to the rock, water will come forth. And Moses swat, uh, smacked the rock with his staff and the water came out. Well, the water came out, what's the big deal? Because if, if Moses speaks to the rock in the name of the Lord of the God of Israel, water come forth, that's the Lord God of Israel who's making the water come. When Moses takes his, his uh, club and swings it at the rock and knocks a hole in it and the water comes out, now who's the, the celebrity? Who gets the praise? Moses. Moses. Okay? Moses just made one bad move and everything that he had lived for and led for for years, decades, was gone just like that. We might think that that seems kind of harsh, but the point is that God is really looking so intently for people who are willing to obey totally and completely. Not, well, I want to get around to it, or I'll mostly do that, but that might be scary, so I'm not going to do everything. When God speaks, his word is to be carried out. He, uh, 
he has it taken away. Um, we probably should read Samuel's words there in verse, uh, was that 20, 22? Actually, the, uh, I don't mean to uh, interject. But you will. Uh, verse 16 uh, and on is, seems like a good thing to show Samuel's attitude. Yes. Okay, so, um, so Saul uh, throws the soldiers under the bus. The soldiers brought them. They brought the best things to the Lord for sacrifice, but everything else is gone, and that's for sure. Uh, Samuel said to Saul, enough. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me. Although you were once small in your own eyes, you did not become the head of the tribes. Of, did you not become the tri head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission. I completely destroyed the Amalekites. Well, most of them. But I brought back Agag. The soldiers took the sheep and the cattle. The best was devoted to God to sacrifice them to the Lord at Gilgal. Okay? Again, he's not really taking any responsibility. He's a, he is a horrible leader. Perfect for Washington, D.C. It was them, the other teams, the other party, you know. Oh, you had me. Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? These are probably words you should embroider into a cross stitch or uh, make vinyl stickers for your refrigerator. <clears throat> does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Saul's all sad. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I've sinned. I did this horrible thing. Forgive me. Forgive me. And um, Samuel has to take care of things. Samuel carries out God's word. He kills Agag right there on the spot. And Samuel never has anything to do with Saul again while he is alive. He walks away from it. Uh, it says that he mourned for him. And he then mourned there's... For Saul. He mourned for Saul. He was so, so very sad of what he had done. He had had a part of this. You just can't believe that this... this king over God's people had turned out to be so disobedient and so selfish and so irresponsible. I can't believe what I've done. And then there's that big verse, the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king. Samuel is mourning, God is in regret. <clears throat> so, Zip back to Samuel standing in front of little David, the shepherd boy, and the rest of the brothers. The Lord looks at the heart, man looks at outward appearances. We almost always judge books by their covers, don't we? Yeah. Almost always. But God is not fooled by attractive exteriors. You know, you can put curb appeal on a dump and somebody will buy it. But, but God, God isn't into curb appeal. Um, it really reminds me of what Jesus says over in Matthew 20, uh, 23, verse 27. He's talking to the Pharisees, and he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. God always sees through the veneer. He always knows what is below the surface, always. God knew in looking at Eliab and Abinadab and Shema and 
Nathanael and Ozem and Radai. He looks at, at those boys and says, pretty nice looking guys, but that's their heart isn't right. Is there one more son? Well, yeah, there is. There's the, the, the baby. He's out taking care of sheep. So David is summoned, comes from the pasture. He stands before Samuel. Um, the description of him in the original language um, is a little more specifically descriptive than like the NIV is. Um, the NIV says, um, what, what about his appearance here? Um, he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Okay, the literal description is that he was ruddy. Ruddy means uh, an, another guy in, in the Old Testament that's described as ruddy is Esau. Kind of reddish auburn hair, kind of that reddish, maybe undertones, maybe he's got freckles or something. Uh, I don't know exactly, but um, but he is ruddy. The NIV says that that is glowing with health. You know, he's got he's got his little apple cheeks, and he's the picture of of perfection there physically. He's spirited. He uh, he's noble. Uh, wait, uh, he's he's fair skinned. It also says that he has beautiful eyes. Um, it could mean that he was pretty to look at. But literally, it means that he has beautiful eyes, um, and uh, in in general, he is a very good-looking young man. Even though he did turn out to be an attractive young man, that's not his best quality. His greatest quality, God says, is his heart. That David is a man after his own heart. Seeking after it, made in the same image of, feels compassion the same way, has mercy the same way. That's the thing that makes him qualified. And that's what makes God say, this, this is the guy right here. This is the one you want. Throw your rope around him. He's the next king. Anoint that boy. And so we come to the end of chapter 16 um, uh, with... Uh, with Samuel doing this anointing. Samuel takes the horn of oil and anoints him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel went off to Ramah. Okay, I'm making myself a note here to talk um, next time specifically about anointing, uh, what, that, what that meant in the Old Testament, uh, some of what that means um, means now, okay? So um, was he anointed in front of all these people in the village? Well, they all came for the sacrifice. You know, it doesn't mention anything about any of the rest of those people being there. Um, at least when that conversation is going on about, well, this one's pretty. Nope, he's not the one. So um, it does go on... Well, it's in the presence of his brothers. In five. And his dad. So Jesse and all of those older brothers have seen that David has been anointed by Samuel. Whether they completely understand everything that's going on there, I, we don't really know. <clears throat> because it seems like that would have maybe an impact on their relationship with him. But he is always still their stupid little brother that is just a jerk. So, but in five it says Samuel told Jesse, "Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice." Oh, the people, come with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Six, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eva and thought, "This is the one." So they're. But then they had to send for David. So right. They left while they were David. Yeah. Was, I, I get it the sense from my reading that most of this took place in the house of Jesse. I always imagine the front yard, but yeah, sure. 
I, I don't know. I'm not sure which is which is the right understanding. If it's in the presence of all of these people from Bethlehem, or if it's just Jesse's family. Okay. It might not make a big difference, but I suppose it would it would probably make a difference to the people of Bethlehem that they had seen that you know Jesse's family was favored and that David had been anointed. Then he would be taking over from Saul. At at a minimum, he might not have known that at the time. all of his family is aware of it. And and I'm assuming again that some of these brothers are not like 19 year old brothers. These are adult brothers because they've got children who are old enough later on to be generals while David is the king. So clearly, you know, these are these are adult brothers. I think probably in my flannel graph brain from 1970 something that they're all like 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, my stair steps all the way down. But that that may not actually be the case. Okay, so it's kind of like uh, <clears throat> uh, Joseph and his older brothers uh, is the same deal between David and his older brothers as we read when we go to uh, David and Goliath's story. Yeah, because David is showing up to be part of the action, and the older brothers are going. Get out of here! Well, who do you think you are anyway? Go, <laughs> go home. Yeah. Take care of the sheep. Son. That's right. Okay. Well, um, that's going to bring things to a close. We'll pick up again um, next week, somewhere in the vicinity of First Samuel seventeen ish. Um, we were, we are going to talk a little bit about anointing. That's a word that gets used a lot. And um, I probably wouldn't go along exactly with everything that everybody says about it. So anyway, uh, we're going to take a look at that next time. Thanks so much for being here. Joanne, it's lovely to have you here. Hi, Joanne. Catherine and Hannah had to run a little bit ago, um, but, but they were here. And um, glad you all could be here. Did you all start at 6.30? 6.15. 6.15 to 7.15 is what we aim for. Sometimes it's more like 6.20 to 7.09 or something, but yes. I'm sorry I wasn't here. I ran off against something, but I knew it still was at 6.30, and I thought we started at 6.30 from Friday. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if you would like any of the notes, they're certainly available. And you can always go watch it on YouTube. Um, as well, though uh, all the Bible study things get moved over there too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye, Joanne. Have a great night. Bye, Joanne. Bye, Joe. And goodbye to all of you friends. See you on YouTube.